Welcome to Straightening the Record podcast, episode three. Um, it's been a long time since I've done one of these, and I am honestly not super proud of that, but the second episode with Honey Creeper was a big learning experience for me, as was this episode. Um, for one thing, after recording was all said and done, Lindsay from Honey Creeper pointed out to me that maybe I could have started tape rolling well before um, I actually wanted to ask them questions. My goal with this thing is certainly to have people in a comfortable place, in a comfortable frame of mind, before having a conversation. And we kind of just jumped into it with that one. Um, so I went ahead and started this episode recording about a solid hour before we maybe a half hour before we uh, before I actually talked about music with them at all um, my guests this time around were Charlie Cacciatore and Griffin Clark of Good Morning Midnight who are a great band um, I met Charlie initially in about 2014 when they were in a group called Grand Champ. Since then we've played a decent number of shows together and I've been a big fan and it was a real pleasure to have them here. The conversation this time around goes from actually talking about Charlie's writing um, and influences to personal life, gender, uh, even gets a little bit political, so fair warning there. And um, as this is a longer episode, I don't want to talk too much longer, but thanks once again to Charlie and Griffin for stopping by and hanging out. And I'm very sorry it took so long to get this thing done and out in the world. Uh, Good Morning Midnight released their second full-length album, Both Neither and Both this weekend at the mill in Iowa City and you can find that record on Spotify on all the major streaming platforms including Bandcamp where you can I believe also order your own copy um, I highly encourage you to check out this record we're starting the podcast this time around with uh, Ballerina which we talk about a bit in the interview and ending with a song called Josie's Experiment which we also talk about in the interview um, I hope you enjoy the interview and uh, hope you enjoy Good Morning Midnight thanks <laughs>
victories here and there You dream of God and call it a nightmare Basket of Flowers, like with a with a band. a year ago, yeah. four piece band. Yeah, that was dope. I missed that lineup. Well, it's just us plus Patrick Jasper. Yeah. But, yeah that's cool. So you've just been too busy being in Chicago. Yeah, man, it's too. I don't. Yeah, Chicago is far. Yeah, like For it's sure. like. He, he is a good He's fit. doing his own thing and stuff too. So. Yeah, for sure. His music's tight. Too. Yetta, have you heard them? Um, I think I've heard I've, I've heard him do it solo. Yeah. <laughs> well, he has like a math rock band uh-huh. called Yetta. And it's like, they're, re- they're really good. They're just like super good musicians. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like I was supposed to go and see them at some point and for some reason I couldn't. I was kind of bummed about it, but I don't remember when that was or yeah. why I couldn't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really fun after like hearing the new record a couple of times to get to just sort of immediately go and see you guys do the songs. Um, I I really uh, enjoyed the intro to uh, to Ballerina. Like I told you, I, I thought that was like so cool and trippy. And, and like, uh, as I was watching that happen, I was like, I was like sort of curious about whether it was, you know, like, is it always different or is it like, yeah, it is. What, what was, what was your like direction as to like how we're going to do that? (laughs) Um... Well, Jordan, Jordan is really into Don Caballero, Don Don Caballero, uh-huh. and I just told him to do something like that. Nice. <laughs> and you just sort of followed. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. I, yeah I, mean, I knew I wanted something like arrhythmic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fair. Yeah. No, I was like, I I figured it couldn't be the same every time. Just like off of how it sounded but but it was but it was to, to me it was like okay yeah this had to have, have some kind of like uh how do you say like uh planning to it you know some kind of like direction at least yeah you know some intended thing i feel like at one point i knew exactly 
my intention on that, but it's go- I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> right, because like a lot of a lot of those tunes have been around for a while, right? Like in much that the one's same... the oldest. Yeah, because you you've been playing that for like you've been playing ballerina for like a couple of years. Yeah, like before Basket of Flowers came out, even mm-hmm. so. Why did that not make the cut to on Basket of Flowers? Um, because I had I had more than enough songs together for Basket of Flowers, and jeez, I don't know. I'm sorry. No, um, that's that's okay. You don't. You I don't think, have to know. I think I, I was uh, just like, like I sensed that Ballerina was like a new direction. Like Basket of Flowers is like very is. Uh, it's not as dissonant or like noisy yeah. as that song ballerina, and so I kind of like use that song as a as like a guide for. I sort of wrote the record around that song. In oh, a way. that's that yeah. makes a lot of sense because well, you do sort of come back to that riff yeah later on yeah. in the record, and then uh, you also have the the like image of the ballerina in the music box on the. Cover. Yeah, and on t-shirts, uh-huh. and it's kind of and on put like flyers for shows. And yeah, it's kind of become like a logo in a way or something. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Is that like, is there something about that image that speaks to you, or is or is it just like something that looked cool, or like sounded um, like it would be cool? <laughs> I mean, it's it's more valid, too, it's more aesthetic than anything else. Like, that's like. Yeah, it's more just like stylistic. There's not like a story behind the use of that image. Um, but I guess I just uh, there's something kind of eerie about a little person inside of a box. That yeah, just the does crank its thing. music. Yeah, and is I feel like that image could even could be used in horror movies in a really effective way. I think it probably has been. Yeah. And I feel, I feel like it's really easy to use that image as a juxtaposition for something really intense. Yeah. Too because it's so innocent. Yeah. And it's so innocent that it's scary, you know. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. Kid ghosts are the absolute creepiest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was actually like a a whole sort of inside joke with John Fox back in like 2007 or so he, he like I think he even had it written on his snare drum I hate kid ghosts nice. um, that's funny uh, I'm gonna say that to him yeah <laughs> just a- ask him how he feels about kid ghosts yeah for I'm sure. going to I doubt if he'll listen to this so um, <laughs> yeah so if he so if if you want to just like drop that on him, he'll be like, "Oh yeah, dude, fuck kid ghosts." <laughs> like, and they are—they're the worst. Like, they're—they're they're certainly the creepiest part of any movie that has them. Casper, for example. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, Casper's, Casper's uh, one of the more popular contenders. Also, yeah. um, the the girls from The Shining. Like, mm. I, I don't think there's any part of the movie The Shining that is scarier than those girls. Or maybe like I mean the the part with the tidal wave of blood is kind of scary, but have you seen Hereditary? Yes, and, and the little girl. That girl is super yeah. creepy. Yeah. yeah, I actually did get to see that in theaters. Me too. I saw it with my mom. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. That's I would weird. not have wanted to watch that with my mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like brought her because I because I understood how funny it was to bring my mom to that movie. Okay. And just like, all right, it was going to be weird. <laughs> and then it was weird. <laughs> yeah, and it was, too. Yeah. I did a, I did a first date uh, to that movie just because I had yeah. been talking to a person, and they, and they were like, we both wanted to see it. And it was like an opportunity for both of us to see a movie we wanted to see. And it was kind of like, yeah, if we aren't actually compatible, at least we both got to see this movie. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether it's whether it's right or wrong or 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 a good way to approach Tinder at all. But but at least I got to see that movie. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So actually, I'm really glad that you um 
mentioned the thing about ballerina being like more dissonant and more noisy Mm -hmm. sort of like by design um, because that was definitely something I noticed about the record and and how like even though it does take that uh, it like takes that totally separate track from from all of the material that was on Basket of Flowers uh, because that record I felt like was while it was more grandiose in its yeah. scope in mm-hmm. a way it was it was Definitely also like was. it was also it's, more like uh, straightforward in terms of like absolutely the song structure and stuff absolutely, like that yeah. um, I would agree and so so like I guess you you already said that you sort of built the record up around ballerina as a as a song but like um what was it aside from the the sound of the song and like the dissonant style of it that that like made it feel like you could develop the rest of the material around that well it i guess something that me and luke who engineered it kind of talked about it, is that there's a lot of like I use the word juxtaposition again mm-hmm. of um, kind of like intense tones with like soft vocals mm-hmm. whispery like Elliot Smith sort of uh, yeah because you do have a soft voice yeah yeah so I think that that grew out of that, um, and I think the whole most a lot of the songs on the record go for that. That's cool. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, because it. it does I focused more on sounds this time around than on basket of flowers, tones and sounds. Mm-hmm. And I could see that listening to it, uh, like. Like, the songs are all there on Basket of Flowers, but, like, if you'll forgive my saying so, it does feel like, at moments, like, not everything quite fits together, you know? Like, like it feels like this was more of a, like, uh, conceptually tied together. Yeah, um, Yeah, I mean, like, on Basket of Flowers, like, there's a song with, like, a clarinet and flute. I love that part, though. Oh, yeah, it's a great song. I forget which... But when you compare that to, like... Yeah, that's Canteen Song. Right. But, like... Like, Burial Ground, Breeding Ground is, like, a totally... Totally different vibe. Yeah, yeah. So... And it is nice to hear an eclectic record Mm -hmm. at the same time. Like, it's it's fun to listen to something and get taken to a lot of different places like that. But... But... I think with Basket of Flowers, I was, like, trying to show how much I could do. So I played most of the instruments too, and mm-hmm. um, like with both neither and both, I definitely focus more on having a unified sound, and yeah. I think that I'm headed more towards something that's even more unified. And I think I'm, you know, letting go more, being less involved, letting other people play in songs. Yeah. And so. Which is probably more than a little bit of a relief to not have to oh yeah and write every part totally yeah and out of the relief will come out of I see something I've noticed is like you know it's just the path of least resistance good things come from that so good things come from collaboration yeah too. Mm-hmm. Uh, just not not like being stuck in your own head about it yeah. Um, just yeah, allowing other people's sp- spontaneity to flourish around you. Totally. Yeah. So, um, was there was there stuff in the studio then that like Griffin and mm-hmm. Joran and um, the other players like just kind of came up with at the time? Or yeah. Did, or did you like definitely Marina Kushner? She's a friend of mine. I, a very good friend of mine who lives in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh-huh. and she played violin on a bunch of songs, and I didn't have anything for her. I just told her to come, and she said, okay. 
and she came up with all of her parts in a like six hour session um and she was on about that many songs yeah like six or seven songs i think she ended up being on three songs oh okay but she played on more there yeah she did take a lot more songs than that okay um and then like ballerina and josie's experiment we did that live as a three piece oh cool griffin and jordan did their own thing for sure on those um yeah i really enjoy your style of bass playing too (laughs) by the way i i have to say like i noticed it when i would see pelvis uh the couple times that I got to see Pelvis, yeah. uh, but but it was something that like I guess because the lighting was better last night that I <laughs> I actually got to like watch your hand a little more <laughs> and like see what you were doing, and I've always been scared to play that many power chords on bass, <laughs> but but like uh, I don't know why, but but you do it better than anyone else I've seen. Like that seems like such a dumb thing to just be like. You play power chords better than anyone, <laughs> but like, but I don't, but I don't see people play power chords on bass that much, and it like for some reason you do it better, and it's, you and the way you integrate harmonics. It can be a dangerous good. territory to go in as a bass player. I think you know you have to you have to be careful with it. It's one of those things. Same with like, I like to use chorus a lot on bass. Mm-hmm. I just think that sounds awesome, and it's like one of those things where you can't. You can't just have bass on your, or chorus on your bass the entire time, but you got to uh-huh. use it in very like uh, tasteful kind of manners and stuff. Same goes with power chords, and that's something I try to do with like bass playing. Uh, my approach to like playing bass has like I always start like I started guitar. Like, I right. started as a guitar player, and my approach to bass playing has been like similar to my approach of like guitar playing. Um, I really just try to like make it more melodic and kind of like interesting while still trying to like accomplish like the important key points of like bass playing. Um, Mm -hmm. Just not step on toes. Right, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you don't want to try and be like too overpowering because it's easy to do that playing bass um, just like everything else but it's important to know when to like you know, use stuff like those power chords or like those you know, weird melodic bass lines or something like that and when to just like when just take a step roots. back yeah. You know? so. yeah well I, I feel like playing as a three piece gives you a lot of freedom mm-hmm. to yeah. open up and that's that's the thing like, I play a lot differently as a three piece than we did yeah. on our tour earlier yeah. this year when totally. we had like five people in our band mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I feel like playing in the three piece I feel like you and Jordan both are pretty adventurous because there's a lot of space to do so, mm-hmm. which right. is the beauty of a three piece. Yeah, <laughs> so, I love one it. One of the many, and yeah, the plan for the next record is to record everything live as a three piece, and then add stuff on top of that. So, yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, it seems like it seems like kind of a lot of people are gradually gravitating towards the like doing more live recording like that too because when I talked to Ryan uh, about the extra vision record and the new material that he was working on he was like yeah you know like well because Ryan also did a, a cover song with Logan and Christian and they recorded all of that live and then did like a few over yeah. and mm-hmm. and uh, he was saying how much better it kind of felt to, to do that than to like Lay down a bunch of guitar parts in a oh, row, yeah, and then, like totally have talk to plug. Steve Albini. <laughs> watch the Steve, watch two Steve Albini interviews, and you will want to only record live forever. <laughs> yeah, actually, that I did go on like a whole kick of. One time, I took acid and watched Steve Albini interviews for four and a half hours. That sounds awesome. It was yeah, it was great. That sounds like the best acid trip. Actually. Yeah, it was terrible until I started doing that. <laughs> I was like, not okay. And then I was like, I'm going to watch Steve Lee talk. Nice. Because <laughs> he felt intentional about his words. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and that's the, how and he way, is as an engineer, too. The way he uses, like, like the word flattering instead of the word good. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> totally. He'll, he'll say, like, <laughs> Very I, I, wa- I want to, like, 
get a, a, a flattering sound for this band's aesthetic or something like that like like those types yeah, of words true. where where he's like he's just thinking more about like making the band look good yeah and sound like Absolutely. themselves and um mm-hmm. And so, do you think that's more the direction that you that you do? You think that's what you got from Luke with with this record too? Um, no, I don't think Luke had anything to do with that. Um, Luke's guy is Steve Albini, uh, so I mean, if you ask Luke what he thinks about something in your recording, he'll just say, "That's not my job. I'm the engineer." Oh yeah. How do you want it to sound? Yeah. Okay. So Luke rarely has input artistically about what's going on. Okay. Um, which is something I appreciate about him, and also something that frustrates me about him. Sure, because you can't, it's hard to be objective about your own stuff. Yeah, so you especially as a solo artist, like, there's, you know, if it's just one-on-one in the mm-hmm. studio, yeah. me and him. It can put a lot of weight on you. Yeah, oh, it does, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'm also thankful that he, it also, you know, challenge me uh i think i think that i got a lot out of working with him because he um you know he does leave you grappling with your own questions in your head Mm -hmm. so uh i think yeah i think i gained a lot more autonomy just as an artist doing that and also just as a person in my life so that's really great because like I actually had the thought last night um, that I think last night was like the most confident I've ever seen you playing guitar and like being a front person yeah and um, well it's great when you can trust your bandmates like Jordan and Griffin are I they're I mean that's the ideal band for me like yeah. in, in Iowa like yeah, they're my favorite musicians in Iowa, pretty much. So it's easy when you, <laughs> you when you trust the people behind you. It's it's, it's immensely helpful. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. it definitely. Because um, I I saw Pelvis too when I was like sixteen. Right. And yeah, I felt the same way about Griffin's bass playing. It's yeah, either. it's just like really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't believe that for <laughs> a second. Um, I mean, well, and it, and again, I also felt like like the record sounds more confident. Like, again, not not shitting on. Oh no, there was a very all, clear. I wanted. I finished it in a month and a half. All tracking was done in a month and a half. Basket of Flowers took six months to do. Uh-huh. I made a point to make everything intentional and to do one or two takes as often as I could and no more than that. Uh-huh. Um, I was listening to a lot of like songs at Ohio, mm-hmm. who does everything in like one live take. Like all their records mm-hmm. were done that way and. Yeah, I want. I wanted. I also wrote a lot more stuff on the fly. Basketball flowers was all calculated, and uh-huh. and there a whole notebook of notes for for every song. Where yeah, where everything fits in. But I just kind of approached it like these songs are well written, and everything else will follow because these are good songs. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think? helped you achieve that sureness in in yourself and in your songs and everything because like um i don't think when i was 20 i had anywhere near you're 20 right yeah i don't think i had anywhere near like that. i started working on it, recording it when i was 19 yeah just for, for the record yeah <laughs> yeah no it's, it's good to have the facts yeah um but yeah I well i know. think one of it is i drop it at school yeah so you just spent like way more time just playing that definitely but also uh when i was recording this album it was the most transitional period of my life so far Uh because i mean since i was five years old i've been you know waking up at seven or eight in the morning and going to this routine 
yeah. for eight hours and then coming home. And I mean, it, it's a shock to your system when, when I mean, people who graduate from college. I basically experience what most people do when they're like twenty three or twenty four after they graduate college. Yeah, it's like that free fall. Like, oh, geez, okay. What do I do now? Yeah, yeah, right. And so, like. But I guess it surprises me that instead of being, like, confused and, like... Oh, dude, I was super... Con- I'm confused as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not saying I'm not confused, but... Um, sorry, what were you going to say, though? Well, no, just, like, as in... Uh, when I... I can only compare other people's experiences to my own. You know, like, it, like anybody. But, yeah. like... But it, Human but, beings. But when... But, I tend to experience that that if my life goes through a drastic, quick change, I have no productivity because I'm just like thinking about what I'm gonna do about it. Yeah. You know, so it impresses me that that well, you could just like. For me, what I was gonna do about it was record an album because I had the song written. So. Like, so. <laughs> so yeah. you, so and and that's sort of been a pattern too, where like. Uh, by the time you got done with the Grand Champ record, you had pretty much all of Basket of Flowers written. Mm-hmm. And I assume, like, you had the majority of... I mean, we said you already had Ballerina written before Basket of Flowers even. Oh, yeah, was. both Neither and Both was written. What's funny is the day I finished Basket of Flowers mixing with Luke, he asked me if I had the next one done. Uh-huh. And I thought about it for, like, ten seconds. And then I just said, yeah, yeah. And so, like, I didn't realize that I had it finished until he asked me that question. Oh, yeah. So literally, like, the day that we finished mixing Bath with Flowers, I knew what I had for the next one, which was kind of beautiful in a way. Yeah. You knew that you could move on pretty soon. Yeah, definitely. So it's not hard for you, then, to, like... Because I know, for me, it's hard to, like, let old songs go. Like, I, I usually phase them out really slowly and stuff, but, like, it seems like you, you don't really have a problem with just, like, okay, that was cool. Well, for yeah. me, it's, like, I have, a, like, I'm neurotic about getting new stuff in. Like, after I released Basket of Flowers, we did, like, the release shows, and then immediately I started playing new songs live. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't even, like, after, like, four shows of... Basket of Flowers being released, I was already playing completely new yeah. stuff. You were totally. Right. I wasn't even promoting the album really because, <laughs> like, because of that. And yeah. So I wish that, in a way, it's a problem for me because I also want to value the old stuff too. Yeah. But I don't know. I just think, I just th- uh, think that's so cool because, like. I mean, and I know you, that you're not the only person who does that either. Like, there's lots of people who will have, like, entire batches of songs, like, way ahead of yeah. what, what their release schedule is mm-hmm. or whatever. But but it impresses me anytime anybody's that productive and because and, uh, I'm so bad about do, getting shit done. Um, but Yeah, it never feels like I'm being productive. I mean, I feel like that's, like, the the state of the artist is always feeling like you're not doing enough. Yeah, that's very true. Which I think some of that is necessary to keep you moving. Yeah. But it can consume you to the point where you actually just don't do anything because you're so frustrated with how you'd never do anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that, isn't that the truth? Uh, and I guess, yeah, I, I, I do wonder sometimes if that's, like, a thing that artists in general have or if it's a product of um, the fast-moving time that we live in, uh, where, like, the majority I of think there's something to be said for, I mean, the effect of industrialization on, on the individual's outlook on what productivity is. Right. And disassociation from the present Mm -hmm. into you know yeah I think there's definitely something you said there I was also curious if there's anything you've been reading that has influenced your uh... yeah um, 
Actually, in the liner notes, I thanked a couple poets that I've never even met just because they had. Because I noticed the lyrics huge. have taken a turn as well. Yeah, um, James Galvin is one. He's uh, He actually teaches at the Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa, so he lives in Iowa City. I met him once. Uh, it's just like a handshake. We didn't talk or anything, but um, yeah. He, that had a big effect on the lyrics, his writing. Um, there's also a poet named Calvin Bedient. Be- Okay. Who? Yeah, those two. I think for both neither and both have mm-hmm. the biggest effect. Yeah, because there are a lot of um, a lot of really really interesting turns of phrase that, of course, uh, sometimes I take notes for these things and sometimes I don't, and uh, usually when I don't is when I can't remember stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, the the line, uh, a something called never mind. Oh yeah, in a little muck called never mind. A little muck called never mind. Yeah, just like stuff like that 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 I I hear it and I'm like, I don't know what that means, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like and yeah. and I think that I always enjoy stuff like that. Like, mm. um, I don't know, the Mars Volta had stuff like that. Blood Brothers had stuff like that. Where like. Like, I don't know what that lyric means, but I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I do know what it means when you say, I mistook your full belly for a trampoline. Cause really? That, cause that's the, funny, because I don't know what it means. <laughs> well, it just sounded like something a little kid would do to their dad to me. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, like, I don't know, I think my dad used to yell at me for, like, flopping onto him when he was in a chair or something. Yeah. Just be like, oh! You know, and, like... Got some sharp elbows there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I think that song. I think a lot of the songs are about just like the pure difficulty in navigating relationships. Mm-hmm. I think that line definitely came from from that. A muck called never mind. The yeah. full belly. The full belly did. Okay. Yeah. I think there's like three different focuses uh, I think that like the three things in the lyrics that are overarching themes uh, definitely I definitely I mean I wrote all these songs while Donald Trump was re- was you know rising to power mm-hmm. and becoming uh, president yeah there's so I think because of that there's a huge like impending sense of doom mm-hmm. in the lyrics um, like the Great Lakes will swallow Minnesota the Great Lakes will swallow the Midwest like I had a dream where the Great Lakes swallowed the entire Midwest wow uh, and uh, I loved the line I'll just fucking punch the wind I will, so I will punch the fucking wind Cause that's I like- really tried to like end both neither and both in a different way than Basket of Flowers because Basketball Flyers has this, like, triumphant, like, we're gonna die, but just be in the universe. Yeah, yeah, energy yeah. will... And it's, and like, it's, it's like, the universe cool. is love yeah. and hopeful. Whereas this is, like, futility, just pure yeah, futility. Yeah, just punching at the wind. That's, like, yeah. that image is, like, the most, I mean, like, hopeless. Yeah, possible thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I loved it for that reason, honestly. Yeah. I, like... When I realized that that was the, the thing you were about to do last night, too, I was just like, yes. Oh, it was like, cool when uh, we, like, took, when I dropped out to tune. Oh, yeah. That song. Oh, yeah. I'm going to do that from now on. Because then it hits, like, extra hard. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. Just on a side note. <laughs> but, uh, Happy accident. Take a mental note. Yeah. Sure. Can I? Yeah. Make sure you tune in the middle of that song. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, aside from, I mean, there's also like a line about it. every cop killer gets a shiny trophy <laughs> yeah I, laugh when I... I really enjoyed the the one before that which is uh for every thousand fascists there's one killing machine yeah yeah uh which feels very true like yeah honestly like there's simply not enough people i don't know being being truthful yeah 
I, I would agree. And that was definitely like a nod to what he got through. Oh, yeah, yeah. Too, yeah. Obviously. But, right. Yeah. Um, on, ironically, the less folky record. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I still think that that line's really good because it's because it's just like I don't know. There's there's something really uh, resonant in that. Are you comfortable talking about the title of the record? Yeah, because that has to do with. I assume it has to do with your um, gender identity. Yeah. Um, it's basically just that, right? Just like... No. Like... I wanted to, like, make a nod to that without being a token. I think it's both neither and both is just a universal answer to a lot of questions. It's a, a paradoxical answer. No, that's the, yeah. That's also a really interesting point. It, it tied in with the way I was thinking about my gender at the time, for sure, mm-hmm. and is probably still relevant. But, you know. Yeah, when you when you uh, announced that that was the title, I was like, oh, cool, um, because it sort of reminded me of a song by an artist from Minneapolis uh, who goes by the name of City Councilor. Hmm. Um, their name is Nikki and they have a song where the chorus is feeling like both feeling like neither and I and I realized oh. after seeing them perform uh, that song for the first time that that was like uh, probably the easiest possible way of explaining that um, that feeling of, of that like identity yeah um, in fact, I think I even did that on Facebook one time where somebody was, like, talking about gender identity and they were like, I just don't get it, you know? Like, I was like, well, I, I probably don't either, but here's somebody who does. Yeah. And here's, like, a pretty simple way of, like, feeling like you can get it, you know? And, totally. Like, and not, like, a, a, a simple way of empathizing. And um, so it reminded me of that as well. Uh, That's cool. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, city councilor, but it's spelled like, like uh, a therapist for, oh, for a city. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah, they're really good. I saw them at Kitty City and then at Street Heat. After that, nice. Um, and the other, the other brief gender identity thing that I thought I noticed, and I might be off base with this, was the. Um, the tune where you have the line about you don't have to, I don't have to be a man tonight at oh, all. Oh, cowboy song. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I. I thought I thought that was interesting, and also just like um, the other couple lines in that song, where something like you could just change your name, or yeah, there mm-hmm. there was maybe a line about sitting down on the toilet or something like that. Oh uh, yeah, that's funny because that one that line was a joke. I, I of course it is. Like yeah. I, I thought it was yeah. funny, but it still felt like somehow related yeah. tangentially yeah. to that totally. uh, topic. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's the one line that I <laughs> like kind of regret. Oh yeah, about the whole record. I'm sorry <laughs> I br- even brought it no, up. No, then. no, no, you good. Um, but but yeah, I, I, I did think the the line about um, either you telling yourself or somebody telling you uh, that you should just change your name if if you don't feel like a man per se. Yeah, and I mean that's like again I was like not specifically talking about gender, but it was it's there. Uh huh. It's I was. Influenced by camp readings, camp interpretations of film, like The Wizard of Oz. There's basically a camp interpretations are like reading into things, reading into characters uh, as they're um, being queer. Okay. Basically, when it's not, it was a way that like the gay community. A long time ago, found representation. Okay. Without 
without actually being explicitly just yeah being there. And so that really, I like that because it's not flag waving, uh-huh. it's not tokenizing, and it's universal. Yeah. Um, and I think that's on a few other songs. Like, I mean, part of that song, you could leave this all behind, drive ten minutes south, and you're out of sight. It's like. I was in college when I wrote that song, and I didn't want to be. Uh-huh. So I was having these fantasies of just like, I have a thousand dollars in my bank account. I could just drive, yeah, and see where I end up. Yeah, I was in a relationship that I wasn't happy with, going to college. Yeah, and I didn't want to be. So, um, see you later, Hannah. Yeah. Um, but but there is definitely the. The uh, that's definitely there though the the gender aspect. Sure, okay. sure. So just sort of like uh, I'm sorry, I, I like lost the track as I thought I yeah, might yeah. when they were on their way out. But but uh, more more of just like wanting to be out of a situation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel like that's a I feel like everyone's fantasized about just running away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's like. A basic human, I mean, fight or flight. Yeah, you know, like, it's a pretty. Yeah, it is a, mm-hmm. a basic instinct. Yeah, uh, for lack of a better yeah term, to just like kind of want to dip out of a situation you're mm-hmm. uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. That's something I really like about a lot of your songs is like how it kind of has to do with that like escapism, because mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of like modern music nowadays is like not. It's it's really about like real life concrete things, and it's like it's to a point where that's kind of like okay yeah we experience that every day I want yeah, to like totally. escape from yeah. a lot of that and that's what I like about your songwriting it's like and that's something that's like influenced me a lot too like a lot of the stuff that I've been writing lately has been centered around like es- that escapism and like kind of surrealism and stuff like that so. surrealism definitely because. In a way, like, because I think our society has become more cynical, people don't want to talk about love as much, and they don't want to talk about abstractions as much. Mm-hmm. I think abstractions are what we need in, in, a, in the fascist age of super-duper steroid capitalism and Donald Trump. Yeah. And I think we're missing abstractions. That's why poetry is important. Totally. I have a book of Leonard Cohen poems I haven't touched yet from when he was like really young. I've I've heard about that. I know he has collections of poetry. I I should read them. I don't think anybody writes a better love song than he does. Nobody writes a better song than Leonard Cohen. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I also just just want to put it out there that I've definitely moved away from viewing gender as this like a systematic identity okay uh i don't like identify as gender fluid or gender queer i don't reject it but i don't identify okay with it i embrace fluidity but i don't uh yeah you don't as you said you don't want to wave a flag and you don't want to yeah. be a token and right yeah, yeah. um or I, I think know. that it's for me it was not an embodiment mm-hmm. of anything it was an idea of what I can be in response to what was going on around me okay so it came from you know a thought gotcha that's interesting and good to know, and thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, gosh. There was something that I was talking about. Uh, I was saying there were like three or four main themes. Oh, yeah. Um, not necessarily themes, but not necessarily motifs, just ideas yeah sure uh yeah the the themes or motifs or neither from yeah both there's a lot of catholic imagery sure um which i think is 
there's a lot to talk about today. Like the first song, Dynamite Head. Uh, uh, I thought that was that was sort of funny because I didn't. Um, I like almost forgot that you went to Dowling, and then uh, when you were talking about how how much you appreciated uh, Good Saint Nathaniel oh, yeah. last night mm-hmm. because of that background or whatever. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, that probably did feel good to hear that yeah. kind of shit. Yeah. So I guess like Catholic imagery, queerness, and apocalyptic imagery. That's what I'm trying to get across. Yeah. Yeah. Very sick. Is it, okay, is it and apocalyptic like imagery because of just like the political climate and everything like that? Or is, like, yes, do you think that's what drew that, you that in that direction? That an effect on it. But also, I think humans have always romanticized the apocalypse. The apocalypse is a very romantic thing. It is. It is, in a way, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Like, humans don't want to think that at some point we'll just stop existing and the Earth will be fine without us. Yeah. We want to think Mm -hmm. that we'll have some big grand ending, in a way. Yeah. Or a lot of people do, anyway. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm kind of comforted by the idea that the Earth will be fine without us, and we'll probably just like fuck up at some point and stop stop either just leave or like uh, die. Yeah, out. that's like that's how I like to imagine it will go down. Yeah, <laughs> the Earth is <laughs> They're probably totally fine without us. It did not ask for us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, an underwhelming end to humanity. Yeah. An essay. I just remembered the one other thing that I sort of wanted to get your two cents on because I enjoyed the stuff you said on Facebook about it, but uh, uh, and I'd also like your two cents on it. Oh, I know what's coming. Is <laughs> drum roll. So Luke Tweedy, <laughs> your your engineer for the last two records, um, and it's someone well, who I want to say Dana T engineered Basket of Flowers. Oh, okay. Luke mixed it, but Dana. Okay. And Dana also helped on both me and both a little bit too. Very good, very good. Also good just, things to yeah, have in here. Dana rules. Yeah. Just want to put that on the record. Yeah, Dana's yeah. a really good musician. Yeah. Um, Great to work with in the studio. Yeah. He played on some songs. Was he more um, active in the yes. creative role yes. as well? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so Luke had uh, an op-ed piece where, where he... He said something to the effect of musicians are not valued enough, musicians should be able to charge more for shows, and, like, I've never done this in one of these before where I, like, want to get, like, semi-locally political (laughs) on this shit, but, like, it's kind of stir. I am am (laughs) interested in you guys' thoughts about it because, um... Because I also feel like musicians aren't valued enough in terms of, like, what we actually get, like... Yeah, I mean, there's... Luke mentioned it in the article, like, the cliche about, like, drive a $500 van with $5,000 worth of gear for a $50 show. Right. Mm-hmm. Get 100 miles down the road or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's that's real. <laughs> yeah. It's super real. Um, uh and even more dramatically the concept that like I will use my band as an example because I don't want to ask anyone else what they get paid for anything Mm -hmm. but recently um, I had a band I was was playing in Genuchi Power and we played a 45 minute set at a show we got $40 for playing the show which means a five piece band was paid less than a dollar per minute to to play that uh and that also doesn't include like you know the time to get to the place or rehearsing and rehearsing buying your gear and maintaining your gear because our because our profession slash hobby slash craft whatever you want to call it uh is also one of the professions that requires the most financial investment while getting the least absolutely uh compensation Mm -hmm. for it so. And that like especially resonates me with me as like a solo artist because 
I am kind of put on the spot to compensate everybody who helps me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just want to throw that out there. So, do you, either of you, have any idea what what you would like to see the ecosystem of music yeah. be? Yeah. You know? um, I want to see the ecosystem of music be uh, supported by people who are getting paid fifteen dollars an hour at minimum, who have public health care, <laughs> and who are not drowning in student debt. Right. Uh, uh, I think that Luke is right that five dollars per person is not enough. At a show, and he's right that musicians are undervalued and underpaid. That's absolutely right. Um, but also, people can't afford to give ten, fifteen dollars at a show. I would believe someone if they told me they couldn't afford to give seven dollars at every show. Right. Um, so, this, I mean, we have like an industry that can't support itself. Right. And that doesn't reflect anybody in our community. It reflects on. Our economy. The, yeah, our economy. <laughs> the people who actually have power, which is, you know, s- Well, and all the people who, who claim to love live music, but only buy the $50 ticket to see, you know, insert big name here, um, as opposed to, like, people who love live music who could get a much better value out of going and paying $10 to see more bands yeah. and get cheaper drinks, even. And that's a funny one that I've seen too, where there's like there's like memes out there like, nah, I don't want to go pay five dollars for your show. I'd rather go and spend two hundred dollars on drinks at a bar. And it's like, oh, you you just want to drink. So there's like I don't know. There's there's a lot of like cultural questions to raise there too of like, you know, like bar culture versus quote-unquote DIY culture, which, like, feels kind of like a weird and exclusive term to me, but... It is an exclusive community, from my experience as well. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Which is ironic. Yeah, yeah, it sort of is. Um, I, what frustrates me about the conversation happening in Iowa City is that people, there's, like, basically two different perspectives and it's either Luke is right Luke's a hero for voicing this this isn't a controversy artists need to get paid more or Luke is a classist and he's coming from a place of privilege and both of those perspectives failed to see the big picture that like the, the, the amount of power that Luke has compared to the amount of power I have mm-hmm. is so minuscule when you compare that the amount of power that you know the top one percent has right like we shouldn't be even on a local level each other. yeah like luke's not getting rich no like running the studio he's working over 50 hours a week he built it with his bare hands right he's built a clientele over the past 20 years like uh at the same time so so yeah people people who are ragging on him for coming from a place of privilege it just ridiculous. seems irrelevant. Yeah. Like, but at the same time, people who are, who are just, you know, supporting what he has to say and saying, yes, we should be giving more money at shows, aren't keeping in mind that people don't have that money. Right. It's just, you know, everyone's missing the point, is my opinion. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. It seems like a lot of people like to get hung up on on whatever their own personal battle is when oh yeah and that's really come out a lot in Iowa City because there's a lot I mean people don't like Luke Luke doesn't like some people people don't like each other oh yeah so there's a lot of that shit coming out it's funny <laughs> yeah Iowa City I've always thought was kind of funny like <laughs> it's a I, funny place like it's a funny place yeah. like there, there, there are things that I like a lot about Iowa City and other mm-hmm. things that like would make me never ever want to live there totally same here yeah um I think you were saying something and I kind of just oh uh 
I don't know. I think we pretty much like wrapped up, covered what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, about that article, Charlie was like the very first person I like reached out to. Was like, did you read this? Yeah. <laughs> or, like, <laughs> like immediately, it was just you like Charlie would have something to say. Yeah, exactly. I just, uh, yeah, and it's like I've been booking shows for like five mm-hmm. years. Like I've probably booked over like. 100, 200 shows totally. and it's like over time it's like that that thought has like obviously crossed my mind multiple times it's just like you know like he used an interesting statistic that was like he, he brought up like food gods like how when like they would play shows they would play like the five dollar show and how that was kind of like unprecedented or something for them at the time and that like since then the minimum wage has gone up like x amount and that like by that calculation shows should cost yeah. like 13 dollars yeah. it was like, like 14 dollars and 27 cents yeah. but what that statistic fails to show is that like although minimum wage has risen the cost of everything else has like risen way more and disproportionately at least yeah, yeah disproportionately mm-hmm. and that's kind of the thing it's just like shows that's that's something that is like outside what you, your basic cost of living is, and like so many yeah, people it's fail it's to be room. able to like go anywhere out, have any wiggle room outside what their cost of living is. Right. Yes, and that yeah. paired with just like the oversaturation of there are so many shows in Iowa City, like right. it's hard to even just book a show. Let alone say I'm gonna book a show and it's gonna cost ten dollars. <laughs> well, it's kind of You're the same here with too. So many shows because because here it's like I mean it's essentially this like there's it's a slightly bigger city here it's a it's a slightly bigger scene in terms of like the number of bands that exist. There's also an older crowd and which there's, makes a difference. Well, you would think, right? But yeah. but what I'm saying is that like we have the exact same problem where like the people who are actually interested in going to shows for the most part uh are the people who don't have money yeah um totally so because they're musicians too right. (laughs) right or they're or at the very least they're like or maybe they're like college kids or just like people who love to collect records and right. and you know just enjoy music in general um you know every once in a while you will go to a show and find like a couple of people who aren't musicians who who just love music like musicians yeah. do and um god bless them totally <laughs> mm-hmm. i would so, just i would just really like to see this conversation about door cost at shows I'd really like it. I would really like to see it start a conversation about uh, the disproportionate rise of corporate profit compared to the average wage of you know the average American and um, Citizens United and uh, universal basic income. Yeah. You know, I just wish that people were talking about that stuff right. instead of having a pissing match and about shitting on people. like a local sound engineer about who it built the stage and sound system at their beloved DIY vegan venue, Chocolate <laughs> Blossom Cafe. Yeah. He literally fucking installed the sound system, built the stage, installed soundproof shit on the walls, like, and they all go there. Yeah, everyone who's ragging on them. Right, because that's the, that's the thing about DIY scene in general is you you have to navigate a capitalist economy. That's kind of the thing. Yeah, it's like totally. So, and that that's kind of the thing. Yeah, like you're saying, like people are kind of failing to realize is there is a bigger picture to this. Um, there's a reason we're experiencing this universally across this entire country. Yeah, people people don't have money to give to shows. Uh, people don't have money to uh, eat food. Yeah. Um, how about that? People don't <laughs> people can't have, afford to eat. People don't have money uh, to like get their teeth fixed if they break yeah. them or something. Yeah, exactly. Or like, like whatever the thing is. Like, mm. you do bring up an interesting point though, which is there. There is a remotely small 
number of people comparatively to like people in the in an entire community or like an entire city that can't like do and go support shows mm -hmm. and like like you say there are a, there are a lot of people out there that exist that say I I'm, I love music like I love seeing live bands and it's just like you're gonna pay like a hundred dollars to go to like Jay Z or yeah something. or yeah. Coachella or something yeah. like yeah. that mm -hmm. and um, that's an interesting thing is like what, what is that gap that's like separating like why those people want to go to these things and like not support like local artists or anything like that like what what is it that's causing them to what's interesting about that to me is like I've always like approached that question less about like less of like analyzing the community and ha and the audience and more just like how can I be like the bands that are playing Coachella not that I mean I think you it's a I think what you're saying is right I think part of the about. answer to yeah. that is not be from Iowa oh yeah that's like <laughs> uh, yeah like um, we've, we've got like three bands that. that anybody cares about from this yeah. you know but mm -hmm. uh, from this state but <sighs> yeah but it's I mean that's that's like sort of a cynical shitty joke that I make sometimes is that like you know there's yeah, a very valid it's right <laughs> origin to where that comes from yeah. Yeah. more so. people in Iowa need to acknowledge that yeah everyone wants to pretend that we're like Brooklyn yeah we're not we I have mean, Slipknot we have a yeah we have a we have a prominent songwriter who used to say that Des Moines was the greatest city in the world and uh, recently moved to a different state. Who? I'm not in the business of call-outs here, <laughs> but so I do find it pretty interesting, you know, um, um, that this is the greatest city in the world, but yeah, uh, in order to make a living doing what we want to do, uh, we can't be here, yeah, basically. But yeah, it's kind of sum it all up, I think there's a lot of... It's a lot of places to look at when it comes to that whole like two D um, op ed thing that I think yeah. a lot of people are failing to look outside. A lot of people are kind of just looking at this one specific thing, whether it's like, yeah, people should pay that much more money and leave it at that, or you're a classist, like you don't understand DIY culture and then leave it at that. And it's like yeah. the conversation doesn't end there. Yeah, this has been a right. problem for years. There's like how do you get people who support music to come out to shows? Yeah. Why aren't bars why isn't Gabe's, why isn't the mill paying, giving people guarantee? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it, it just goes up from there. Yeah, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. I think, uh, thanks for talking about that with me. That yeah, was fun. I, I like you yeah. guys. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for being here and hanging out with me and drinking my coffee with me. And, it was delicious. Yeah, it's great. And, uh, thanks, thanks for inviting us to be with Yeah. Absolutely. It's been so much fun. Yeah.
get into that tire swing right now. It's uh, so high up there. It's My it's it's totally tight. possible. We've seen a couple did well. Mm. It's, I haven't seen it's it. possible for humans to do it. It's it may be very very hard if, if you don't like. My if you body don't strength is like, <laughs> yeah. what do you even lift, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Can't get into the tire swing, bro. Yeah, and there'd be a butt too short a chain. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really fun still. Yeah. Try to climb up into it. Don't knock it till you try it. So that would be that's an interesting statement out of content. I bought a too short a chain. <laughs> 